welcome to The Thriving Writer Show. Today on the show, I have the author of four books, including the multi-award winning How to Survive the Worst That Can Happen. Her articles on resilience are featured in the Huffington Post and in Thrive Global. Sandy Peckinpah was forced to reinvent herself after several devastating life events. She's a broadcaster on Periscope, having done over 350 shows, and she shares her passion for helping people rise up and transition through life's difficult challenges to be successful and happy. Her step-by-step -step approach to living a creative life has resulted in several of her clients now having published books, and more importantly, having discovered that they have a legacy to share. Welcome to the show, Sandy Peckinpah. Thank you, Frank. It is my pleasure, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored. Thanks. Well, let me ask you first, uh, how long have you been a writer or called yourself a writer? Well, that's a good place to start because it took me a lot longer to call myself a writer than actually becoming a writer. And so if I, I have to look back on when I married my first husband, my late husband, sadly, when I was 22 years old, we were walking the beach at night, the first night I met him, and I said, so what do you want to be? And he said, I've always wanted to be a writer. Well, how often do we hear that, right? So I said, well, what have you written? And he said, a poem. And I said, well, that's a good place to start, but what kind of a writer do you want to be? And he said he wanted to write books. So from that point forward, our whole courtship was about writing. And we ended up selling his first book two years later to a publisher out in New York, thinking, wow, we finally made it. And we got our first check, which was $1,000. And we realized that <laughs> there was no way that we could raise a family on a thousand dollars. And my late husband, his uncle was uh, Sam Peckinpah, who was a famous film director and uh, writer also. And he had um, done movies like The Wild Bunch, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, um, Straw Dogs, The Getaway with Steve McQueen. So we had always been on sets with him. And we had the experience of being around a lot of creative people. And so when we were in LA, we, had, uh, we were at his birthday party, which is a really fun event. And we saw more stars than you could ever imagine. But what occurred to us is that these people were actually making a living doing something they loved. And it was such an awakening moment because we realized that it is possible. So when we flew home to Monterey, we were living in Monterey at the time, we transitioned over into screenplays. And I have to say that that was a turning point financially and emotionally because it was a commitment to writing. And my husband was the writer. I was his editor. I created stories with him. We created characters. I also studied as an actress and worked as an actress for a while. So I knew a lot about character and we developed a lot of projects together. But I never called myself a writer because my name was never on the script. And it wasn't until 1988, my husband was supervising producer and writer on a show called Beauty and the Beast for CBS. And Beauty and the Beast starred Linda Hamilton and Ron Perlman. It was a beautiful modern day fairy tale of the classic fairy tale. And we had spent uh, months and months and months studying and trying to have the, uh, the emotion and the feeling of what it would be like to be a person whose face couldn't be seen in public because Vincent couldn't go above the city streets without creating terror. He, looked, he had the face of a lion, his nose was flattened, and he had a cleft down the middle of his face that split his mouth like a cat. And so David and I would stay up late at night talking about what it would be like to 
be that person out in public and creating storylines and characters for the show. And I'm really proud of the fact that the show was nominated for an Emmy. And while we were at the Emmys, I was thinking, I have the best life ever. I, we created this amazing life together. We are making a living with his writing and my creative input. What could be better? And all those months of talking about what it must be like to be a disability, at the time I was pregnant with my third child. And a few months after the Emmys, I gave birth to a daughter with a cleft. And I had no idea that she would be born with almost the exact same mouth as Vincent. And I kept thinking, what can I do to create her entree into the world and give her confidence and make her be a star and the star and the hero of her own story? Because all I knew all these years was creating stories. And so I decided that I would write her her very own fairy tale. And that was the first time I ever started writing on my own. And I'm really proud to say that 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 book, not only did she walk into kindergarten with that book and it changed the way people saw her, but that book went on to win awards. And um, 20 years later was recorded as a spoken word CD and, um, and the Moscow Symphony Orchestra did the music for it and it was nominated for a Grammy in 2009. And my little book that I wrote for my daughter became something so beyond what I ever anticipated and I didn't see that at the time. I just saw it as my mission to give uh, my daughter a better life. And so even after that, though, I wrote another fairy tale after that, um, another book for the children with special needs. And, and I was so pleased because up to that point, Amazon didn't really exist. And Barnes & Noble existed. And that was the big bookstore. And somehow my book, Rosie, The Imperfect Angel, got sent to... Um, Steve, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, but he was head of Barnes and Noble. And he had the, a daughter born with Down syndrome, I believe. And he said, you know what our bookstores are missing is a children with special needs section. And so proudly, my little book was the first book put into that children with special needs section in Barnes and Noble. And it inspired me to keep writing. And even then, Frank, I could never call myself a writer. Isn't that the funniest thing? And I love Jeff Goins because he really introduced me to that fact that oftentimes we don't give ourselves the credit we're due soon enough. We have to start calling ourselves a writer and then continuing on that path. And I wish that I had had the courage to call myself a writer after my first two books, but... It didn't happen until my fourth book, and then I started calling myself a writer, and in many ways, I think that book gave me the courage to start feeling like a writer. Wow, that's a pretty impressive start to your uh, writing career. I know it didn't happen overnight, but no, <laughs> it's pretty cool, uh, just the same. But yeah, I can kind of relate to that, not calling yourself a writer for a while. I mean, I wrote when I was a kid, but I didn't think of myself as a writer at the time because mm-hmm. I hadn't published anything. But, but later on, uh, actually, I think it was when I was writing for a client, um, and he told me, you know, this stuff is good. You ought to put it into a book. And I said, yeah, okay, sure, I'll, I'll put it into a book. And uh, then he came back, no, I mean, you really should put this into a book. I said, wow. okay, okay. So that's where uh, a best-selling series was born for me. And wow. At, at the, I think when I got money for my writing, I just felt legitimate at that point, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, 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 and I don't even know for me whether it was money. I think it was, I, a lot of it had to do with writing articles and blogs. That a lot of that credibility for me happened through that process. But I think that fourth book was the magical equation because I didn't write when I felt like it. I made a specific plan 
of how to start writing my fourth book, which was absolutely my hardest book to write. And I think that when I gave it structure, as my late husband did, because my late husband never woke up and said, I don't feel like writing today. He had no option. He was a writer and producer for television. If there wasn't a script, there wouldn't be an episode next week. And I can remember that I would say to him, how is it that you get up and write every day, even when you don't feel like it? And he said, I don't give myself the option. I just do it. And I'm supporting my family. And it means everything to me. And he would do things like if it, if it wasn't flowing, he would write letters to people, so, but handwritten letters and get it flowing. Or if he, or we would sit down and have a, you know, a story conference or, and do character, you know, we would, we would do a lot of um, interactive work having, because I was studying acting at the time. And so we did just a lot of off the cuff acting and, and uh, character development that way. And that would get him going. And then another way is that, um, you know, money is motivating, yes. But it was the contract that was motivating and the people behind the contract because he had people that he had to answer to. Mm -hmm. And so it was, he just inspired me. I, I used so many of his tips and tools with, you know, getting the writing going and how to do it with my own clients and myself. And with that fourth book, I implemented those structures and put them into place. And thank goodness I had him as a guide in my life to know what it's like to be a committed writer. And it's a great feeling, you know? Yeah, yeah. The feeling of accomplishment and just knowing that people are depending on you to produce is yeah. a great motivator, too. Yeah. Um, right. And tell us what your fourth book is for those who are watching and don't know. Oh, well, I say it was the hardest book of all because it was. Um, in 1993, my son uh, woke up with a fever and he died the next morning of bacterial meningitis. It was a very aggressive form of meningitis and it literally took him in 24 hours. And of course it turned our world upside down. And what I thought was a perfect life soon became a very damaged life in many ways. At the door of my home on that day that he died, a man came to our house, Steve Cannell, I don't know if you know him, but he wrote Rockford Files and A-Team and um, you know, he, the Silk Stockings and he wrote, um, more television series than you can ever imagine. But Steve was David's boss because David was co-executive producer with him on Silk Stockings at the time. And Steve showed up at our house with a book and he said, you know, Marsha and I lost our son Derek five years ago. And this book helped us. And it was a book written by a mother who had lost a child also. And he said, this book, we kept with us and kept reading it over and over again. And it got us through the devastation of our loss of Derek. Mm -hmm. And if you can keep this close to you and just read it, I promise you will get through this. Well, I took that book and I took exactly what he said and I kept it with me all the time. It was called A Bereaved Parent. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I wrote my daughter a book. And if I can get through this grieving period, and if I can get through the loss of my beautiful son, I'm going to write a book someday and I'm going to help other parents. And it took me two decades to do that. And I finally did it in 2014. Um, I started writing it in 2013. I, I finished it and I did exactly what my husband did. I would show up to write every single day and it was not an option. Mm -hmm. And I wrote four hours a day actually. And <laughs> I do have a full-time job. I'm a real estate agent for Coldwell Banker and I have a really thriving career in that. 
But I thought, how can I fit this all together because my passion is writing. And so I wrote four hours a day until it was finished. It took me about mm, less than six months. And when it was published in 2014, I just felt this great sense that I had creating, created something beyond my son's life and death, that I had given him a legacy and a purpose and meaning in other people's lives. And it was a way of having him still in my life in a really special way that he was with me. And he was with me every single step of the way that I wrote that book. I mean, we all talk about those magical moments as a writer. Um, I would sometimes read what I'd write the next day and think, where did that come from? I don't know where that came from. And I know as a writer, you know that feeling, Frank, when suddenly you're writing something that comes from far greater than you ever imagined, really. And that's, that's the magic of creativity and being in line with what you're supposed to be writing about, is those kind of magical moments. And so that book, being the hardest that I've ever written, actually was my greatest achievement, I think. Because it, it you know, it's his legacy. And it's great to know that his legacy is... It's not just something that you remember, but something that's helping other people to get yes. something as yeah. hard as what you went through. And um, right. so have you gotten a lot of good feedback from oh. people who have read the book? Unbelievable. I treasure every single time so a parent contacts me and thanks me for writing that book. I just got another card in the mail yesterday from a woman in New York. She's a She's a producer in, uh, on Broadway, and she had a, lost a child. And she said, thank you so much for writing this book. And I realized that what Steve Cannell did for me bringing that book was what I was doing for other people. And I was so grateful. And it continues to give me those gifts. And every single time I get comments from parents, I feel like I'm connected to my boy again. You know, it's that moment where we're one again. And it's a beautiful thing. It makes me feel so good. Oh, man, that's great. I love that. Um, well, I was looking on your Twitter profile. I noticed that you've listed some awards there. Uh, tell yeah. us about how that happened. Or I think my about. book my book did get like nine awards, eight or nine awards, I think. I'm, I'm so thrilled. And... You know, the awards are validating in some way because I know I had some pretty stiff competition. Um, but really the reward of parents telling me how much the book means is far greater. But I think award, it's important to go after some of those awards because it heightens the visibility of your book. And it also gives the credibility that, you know, when I'm asked to speak, that means a lot. It carries a lot of weight. and um, and interviews, whatever, those things do matter. And so sometimes, you know, I think as writers, we get so inside of our head and think that the work should stand on its own. But I think sometimes we have to make the effort to put our books out there to be scrutinized and hopefully awarded. And that makes a big difference in, in what happens to the book. So do you have any strategies for going after something like that? Or is it just a part of your marketing or, or how does. How yeah, that? it was the first year I, I was really, um, I just started reading about all the awards on the internet that I could submit for. And it's not inexpensive. You know, every one of them carries a, I don't know, 50, $75 entry fee. And you have to fill out all kinds of forms, but, and submit the book and send it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why, I don't know why they won. I got the awards because, I mean, there was certainly some competition. And I don't know if I positioned myself in any way more strongly than others. I don't really know what the magic key is to the awards other than I think the title is hugely important. Um, my title, How to Survive the Worst That Can Happen, and the subtitle is Parent Step-by-Step -step Guide to healing after the loss of a child. 
Now, what I learned about titles also from Jeff Goins is that they have to, to capture that attention in a big way and also then explain what the book is about. So How to Survive the Worst That Can Happen could be a book about natural disasters. But I knew that the secondary title was really, really important to getting parents in the direction of my book. And so I felt like the subtitle helped explain it. And so when I was submitted for awards, I always submitted the whole title, not the title and the subtitle. And so it would go like off the page when I was submitting. And I think that really made a big difference because automatically the judges knew what they were looking at. It, it sure is a lot easier to, to know if the book is right for you when the title is good. And mm -hmm. I couldn't compare that to the way you buy an Apple phone. You know, you got these pretty clear choices in front of you, whether as uh, my daughter's a droid fan and I'm like, I could never buy a droid because there's so many choices. I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So I think a title does that really well. If you, if you spend some time on it and really, really think it through. As yeah, and that title, How to Survive the Worst That Can Happen, that's what people always say to me when they hear that I've lost a child. Oh my gosh, that's the worst thing that could ever happen. And I think that's what every parent would feel. And so that just seemed a natural for me. And, um, and it, it, it helped. It helped. Yeah. Um, so what doors would you say this is open for you as a professional writer and a speaker or were you doing some of those things before the book came out? Yeah, because uh, with Rosie the Imperfect Angel, my first book, I actually did a lot more speaking. Um, you know, I had the platform. It was pretty, um, because the American Cleft Palate Association embraced the book. And what happened after that was um, I got asked to speak. And then the Cleft Palate Association wanted to give the book to clinics and hospitals around the United States and also take it like Operation Smile and take it everywhere. And, um, you know, it was, it was pretty special because I got an opportunity to meet so many people. And then they came to me and said, would you do a benefit in Los Angeles for the book to be given to these hospitals? And at the time, my husband was working with an actor named Jack Scalia, and they wanted a celebrity spokesperson for the book. And Jack was working with Melissa Gilbert, who was the star of Little House on the Prairie. And he said, I know the perfect celebrity. Everybody knows her. Everybody loves her. She was Laura Ingalls on Little House on the Prairie. And this was in um, 1991 or two. And I bet she would do the benefit. So she, he asked her and she said in a New York minute and she called me on the phone immediately and said, I would love to be a part of your book. I would love to present it to you um, for the benefit and what can I do? And from that point on, Melissa and I became best friends and we've been best friends ever since. And the beautiful thing about that is that I really feel that People know, like, and trust Melissa because they grew up with her in a show that was really special. And in many ways, that also opens doors. So I often urge writers to make use of those connections like that because it does work. It does, it just, it's just one more connecting point with people. And when I wrote my book, um, Melissa said, I'd like to write the foreword for it because I went through that loss with you and I'd like to give that perspective in your book. May I write the foreword? And I said, of course, I didn't even have to ask her. And so she wrote the foreword on the book and I think that that also gives it some attention. Although it's certainly, a lot of people don't even notice it that it, you know, it's at the top of the title. Do I have it? Oh yeah, here, let's see. Yeah, so she's up here, the forward. And, um, and I think it helps writers to have somebody in your camp who has a wide exposure that you can draw from. And believe me, she is so happy to do that for me. And I know that everybody has one of those people in their lives that would be willing to do something like that. And I don't ask her all the time, but... Um, 
you know, when it works, it's, it's a beautiful addendum to the book writing process and getting it out there. That's for sure. And I know I've used that myself a few times and I plan to do that in the future as well. But yeah. if you're a new writer, um, how would you go about making a connection like that uh, with somebody? Other than just maybe... Well, they say six degrees of separation, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you find your connecting points and, um, and don't use them very often. You know, like that's what I... I never ask her to do anything for me um, because I want to keep our relationship sacred. So, um, you know, you want to just make sure that whatever you do, it's appropriate. And... Um, but I'll tell you, if I was starting all over again as a writer and had access to medium.com like people have today, I would have started my writing that way because that has given a tremendous boost to my writing and my book writing process and my exposure. And when I first started on Medium, I learned about it because of Jeff. Jeff Goins. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And I thought, well, I'll sign up for it. So I signed up for it. And I wrote probably, you know, three or four blogs. Nobody read them. You know, I had probably the most, I had 250 readers um, on four of my blogs. And I started realizing that Jeff didn't always write just for him his own um, uh, byline on Medium, but he started going after publications. Well, I got to tell you that that was the biggest leap forward that I did, and I didn't do that until July of this year. And I went from having maybe 100 or 200 followers to I think I have 2,400 right now. And it seems to grow every, every week. Um, December, I took a little time off, so I lost some ground there. And actually, I still haven't quite gotten back yet because I had a lot of business and a lot of vacations, too. I just got back from New York. And, um, but if I had it to do over again, I would start writing blogs before I ever wrote a book. And I would start putting my blogs out there to see what people respond to. I would go after the publications for sure. And um, just keep responding to people. And I had my articles in, or like one of my articles was picked up by a magazine. Actually, it was a really, I can't remember the name of the magazine, but it's one that I know. And it was a version in England. And it was because they had read something on the, one of the articles that I published either in Thrive Global or on the mission. And I thought, wow, I could have never gotten that far with that magazine had it not been for medium and the mission wow. so you know it's pretty fantastic the exposure we get for free yeah, and it awesome. makes you, i think it makes you a better writer because i've learned so much from the process of writing for medium what works and what doesn't work i see what people respond to and what they don't respond to i've learned how to how to write for the, um, I, I obviously I want to share the best and strongest ideas I have, but I've learned how to write to finish and complete those ideas in order for people to get the complete concept in a short amount of time. And I continue to learn. Every time I think, wow, I finally figured this out, I go back and I read my blogs a couple of times before and I go, oh, that wasn't so good. <laughs> <laughs> I can do better than that. And I wonder if there ever comes a time that we aren't critical of our work because just when I think, oh, I'm really proud of this. And then I go to share it like three months later and think, oh, it needs a rewrite for sure. <laughs> I can tell you, though, in working in the entertainment business, there were times that my husband did nine or ten rewrites on scripts. In fact, there's a movie called Man of the House with Chevy Chase and uh, Farrah Fawcett and Jonathan Taylor Thomas. That was a Disney movie that was written by my husband. And he wrote it about his experiences in Indian Guide 
uh, Indian guides with my two sons. And um, that he, Bette Midler was the one who bought it first for Disney. And she had him rewrite, do a page one rewrite nine times. Nine times, page one rewrite. Mm -hmm. And do you know that at the point that she dropped the project and Disney picked it up for Chevy Chase, that there were several more rewrites on top of that. So when I, when people complain about rewriting or, you know, how frustrating it is to rewrite, that's where the magic comes is the rewrite. And if you can just get the first draft out there that is good enough, then the magic comes in the rewrite. And I'm actually struggling with one of my blogs right now because I'm looking at it thinking, oh, I hate this. I hate it, but I know there are some gems in here. And I've rewritten it three times. And um, I really believe that you should not just put something out there to put it out there. Um, if I tried to write a blog every day, it would not be my best work. I've realized that I am only good for one or two blogs, maybe three a month, because I have a lot of work that I do um, in addition to writing. And if I try and just shove it out there, it's not work I'm proud of. So I think for me, it's better to really focus on a blog and make it to the, the best that you can before you put it out there. And then I think you have to forget about it because I could go back and rewrite every single blog looking back on it now, but I just don't. I let it go and realize that's part of my evolution. Yeah. I used to be an artist a long time ago. and Oh, wow. Really? I, yeah. Yeah. I was a, mostly a drawer, but I, I was a drawing and painting major in college. And wow. I would do is I would go and smooth the charcoal or the graphite or whatever, you know, and erase it and, you know, smooth it some more. And, you know, if you do that enough times, there's a point where the paper starts to deteriorate. Oh. Let it go. So the trick is just to, as you say, find out that point where it's good enough to let it go and just let it go. Yeah. Because you can write another post and the next post is probably – hopefully going to be better than the one you wrote before. And, you know, if you're not always growing as a writer, yeah, it kind of takes the challenge and the fun out of it, you know, and it becomes just like maybe any other kind of work that you do over and over and mm -hmm. over again. Yeah. Well, you know, reading your stuff, Frank, has given me a lot of great tips. I have to say, um, I read, I always look forward to every one of your blogs because I always learn something. Even living with a writer for 26 years, um, I continue to learn from you and other people like Jeff and um, Benjamin Hardy, all of those people. Um, you never stop learning. And wow, I am so grateful for the accessibility that we have to learn from other people right now on the internet because my time is so precious that I work all day. I don't have time to be going to school at night at somewhere else. I can go on the internet and still learn. And I just love what you write for writers. I think it's really important. And your, your tools are right on. Your tips are right on. And I'm so grateful for those. So thank you. So glad to hear that. And uh, especially coming from you who has got so much experience and are so well seasoned that at what you do. Well, you've got a couple of different focus areas. You um, teach uh, women to be more empowered about mm -hmm. their lives and maybe about their struggles. And, but you also teach writers as well. Uh, tell us how those things kind of tie together for you and uh, what's the, the theme behind them that is, you know, what Sandy's about. Ah, okay. Well, um, I can't tell you how many times I get people who say, I've always wanted to write, and you have too, haven't you, Frank? Yes. I've always wanted to write. I've always wanted to write a book. Um, I have so much to tell in my life story. And um, I get connected with a lot of people through loss because a lot of people have come to me who've lost a child or a spouse. or And they always say, I have such a story to tell. And so um, I'm certified as a grief recovery specialist through the Grief Recovery Institute in Los Angeles, although I don't practice it. I, I, I studied it 
for the information more than, than the practice. And what I learned from that is that um, telling your story is so integral to healing. And when I started working with women who wanted to tell their story, they would tell me that they had felt transformed by the experience. And so I take them through a timeline in the process of writing their story. I take them through a timeline of their life and we pull out the parts that they want to talk about. We pull out the parts that we want to explore. And several of my writers have gone on to have published books and I'm really proud of them. In fact, one of them um, is a therapist who had her own story to tell and she published her book and, and her book just got a terrific review in one of the top therapy magazines. I'm so proud of her. And she just didn't know where to start. So where I'm really good is at giving the tools and the structure for helping people discover the story and start writing. Now, um, I'm only working with, I'm working with four people right now. I try not to work with too many people at a time because it's really a lot, it's really a lot of time. And I, I want to devote my time to them. And, but what evolved from my therapist client was that she said, well, why don't we do a right to heal workshop? So we did a workshop last year. It was a tremendous success. I used all of my tips and tools that I knew plus some of hers and it was such a great experience to be able to put that out in bigger numbers and be able to help people with the writing process and the healing process. So that's really my focus. A lot of people will come to me and say, you know, well, I had a lot of life changes because, you know, I experienced the birth of a child who had a, a birth defect. I experienced the loss of a child. Um, as a result of the loss of my son, my husband and I really struggled with our marriage. And at the point that we were, uh, we had divorced and then we were coming back together after so much time had taken place, um, he died suddenly of a heart attack at 54. And I always said he died of a broken heart because he really struggled with that healing process. And, um, and I, I wanted to help other women see that life doesn't, life isn't destroyed forever when you experience so many losses. I went on to, I realized I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And one of them was not standing up as a woman, not standing up and asking for screen credit. When I wrote so much of my husband's work and helped develop those characters, um, why didn't I ask for my own screen credit? So when my husband died, um, his agent said, you know, Sandy, I know that you're a part of it, but you don't have any credibility. You're not even a member of the Writers Guild. Why didn't I ask for that? And as women, we need to start asking for those credits that are due us. I, I mean, he had a 26 year career, over 20 television movies, a mini series, a hit Disney movie, um, uh, and uh, about nine, let's see, nine or 10 TV series. Um, why didn't I ask for it? You know, it wasn't his fault, it was mine. I just always thought life would be that way forever that I would be happy raising my children, editing his scripts. I ran our development company too, so I looked for stories from other people and stuff like that that we developed and, and uh, pitched up to in the entertainment business. And, but I always worked from home. And so when my husband died, when we got divorced and then my husband died, I had no career and no visibility as a writer. And so, you know, I urge people, and not just women, men, you know, stand up for the role that you play in your spouse's life. Stand up for that. And, you know, I think my husband would have been really proud to see our name side by side on a script. It just never happened. So 
people often come to me and say, how did you survive all that? You know, and then I ended up having to raise my three children on my own, my three living children. And then I adopted a fourth child. Um, and, you know, it was sheer tenacity and grit. I moved out of Los Angeles. I moved an hour south of Los Angeles. I got the quickest job I could. <laughs> I got my real estate license. And luckily, we were on an upward swing. And, um, you know, I put my kids through college and yeah, I survived it. And now I'm so blessed to be um, in a marriage with a wonderful man who supports my writing 100%. And he's creative in many, in another way, but he is creative and he gives me great feedback. And um, I love sharing my story with other women who think that life ends because they get divorced or life ends because they lose a spouse or lose a home or lose a child. It doesn't. I'm here to say, I love my life right now. I have a great life and it's not without its problems because I'm still dealing with stuff every single day, but you know, it's pretty great. And writing is a huge part of that and sticking with my passion for writing and sharing my story. That's a huge part of why I'm so happy. And that's what I share with other people. That's a beautiful story. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that uh, those things that happened in the past didn't define your future and where you are today. And I'm mm -hmm. so thankful to that. You know, you're able to share that with women and help them uh, just to claim what, what they're due, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, tell us what you're working on now that you'd like to share with us. What I'm working on right now, and it's the blog that is so hard, um, I saw Thomas Keller speak, who is a three-star Michelin chef. He owns um, the um, French Laundry in Napa and Bouchon in Nat Napa. And I saw him speak because my husband's in the restaurant industry. He supplies... Um, he creates beautiful dinnerware for uh, hotels and restaurants. Mm. And so I got to see him speak. And he had so many steps for personal greatness that I, I, my jaw was dropped when I was watching him speak. I thought, this does not just apply to the restaurant industry. This also applies to life. It applies to writing. It applies to everything we do. How to tap into our personal greatness in whatever passion we choose. So I'm working on that blog right now, and I've been through several revisions of it. But um, I'm also working on a book, and it's actually – Mm, probably almost finished, but it's got to go through a major revision because I started it a year ago and then stopped and started again. And now I, I've lost momentum. So I need to get back into the momentum of working on that book. But I've sort of given myself permission to put it on the back burner right now because I'm so enjoying developing my skills with blogs that it's going to make my book better. And so that's what I want to focus on is more productivity with blogs, more accountability. I want to get at least two blogs out there every month. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot, especially for somebody like you that writes all the time. Um, but for me, um, my job is very demanding, so I, uh, I have to give myself permission to only do two blogs a month, but I feel like that's big. So, yeah, I, I'm so grateful for mission, the mission and Thrive Global and, and, you know, all of those avenues that we can have to put our work out there. Um, I want to stay committed and keep my audience interested because I feel like I – lost a little bit of momentum when I stopped writing in at the end of November. Um, when I stopped writing as, and submitting, I never stopped writing, but submitting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I look forward personally to reading what you write in the future and, um, Thank you. and at whatever level of consistency that you can maintain, I think it's good that you can know yourself and be able to do that. And yeah. I, I think your readers will appreciate it and know when to expect something new from you. Mm, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, any final advice you want to leave for our 
viewers today? Final advice. Well, I think pay attention to what you're doing <laughs> because you have tapped into a great group of writers and tribe builders. And, uh, you know, I'm a member of tribe builders and tribe writers. And I have learned so much from other writers that I think community is hugely important. I am so grateful for the people on those two platforms. I can't even express how grateful I am because that medium experiment launched my readership. It went sky high as a result. And I am so grateful to both of those groups because alone, I couldn't have done it. I couldn't. So yeah, let's, let's keep that community going and that sense of community and keep supporting each other. And um, I just love what that group has done for me and what I see it doing for other people. And I love celebrating the wins of other people because it makes me see it is possible. It is possible. And that's a beautiful thing to see. So yeah, community is huge. I agree totally with that. And uh, it's great to have you as a part of our community and along with all the other great writers in there. Thank you. Well, Sandy, I want to thank you for your time today. And uh, I enjoyed talking with you. And I'm sure our viewers have enjoyed hearing your, your wisdom. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was really a pleasure and I'm grateful. Well, thanks. And I uh, look forward to having you on here again sometime. Sounds great, Frank. All right, take care. All right, you have a good night. You too.